Before, just before we start, I'd like to introduce myself a little bit to you and very briefly explain how I got into chronic pain. It's a story. Um, basically, I've been a psychologist for 30 years and very early on in my career, I was working as a community health psychologist out of a, a hospital in an area just north of Sydney. And a lot of it was treating people for anxiety and depression, fairly run-of-the-mill sort of psychological problems until one fateful day a young newlywed woman was referred to me with excruciating low back pain after she'd been in a motor vehicle accident and she this woman was really in a terrible amount of suffering and as well as that her whole all her dreams of you know working with her spouse to buy a house and have a family had been shattered and she was just living a terrible life um, because she couldn't work. They had had to give up their plans to buy a house and they were living in the basement of her parents' home, her and her husband. And I just felt so helpless. And, you know, the CBT that I, I knew then and worked reasonably well with anxiety and depression just didn't did nothing for this young woman. So that really inspired me to want to learn more about chronic pain and that's a journey I'm going to share with you here today. Um, like, like a lot of us I came I also came to psychology with my own agenda I guess and although I wasn't conscious of it that, at the time um, I don't so for example I don't suffer from chronic pain but by coincidence or not my mother was a chronic pain sufferer and I was the eldest child and um, fair to say a fair bit of responsibility for supporting her seemed to fall on my shoulders. So, um, but I was certainly never conscious of that when um, I, I, I fell into chronic pain, as it were. So, uh, back to, you know, chronic pain. And um, I, look, I started looking beyond CBT for uh, ways of managing pain. And probably the first thing that I went to was Ericksonian hypnosis which was fantastic for its creativity and its emphasis on, you know, finding the resources within the client. Uh, but I soon found out I was no Milton Erickson either. And um, while I was able to, you know, it didn't help a little bit, it still left me a lot short. Then along came EMDR and it just seemed so easy, so quick. And I was really struck by the way it uh, changed the uh, you know the sensory dimension of of post traumatic stress and PTSD sufferers, and so immediately started applying it to people's present pain. You know, just targeting pain itself, and I was assisted in those early days by the work of Bruce Eimer, who was one of the first EMDR clinicians to work with chronic pain and. Um, wrote some uh, very helpful articles about it in the very early EMDR newsletters. Bruce has gone back to his hypnosis, I think, but um, I do owe a debt of gratitude to him. Um, but of course, uh, while it worked for some, it didn't work for others. And so I really went on a journey to learn more about pain and how to work with people who just didn't respond to the standard EMDR protocol. And I learned that also, of course, if, you, if you're learning EMDR, you're going to be learning about trauma. And um, it opened up my eyes to the relationship between traumatic stress and pain and how, how many chronic pain sufferers have really uh, you know, survived, if not physical or sexual abuse, at least very adverse backgrounds, um, attachment deficits, uh, a lot of uh, stress there. And often not big T trauma, but just kind of um, living in unsafe uh, circumstances and just living on the edge in that, in that fight or flight response. And then having sometimes a minor accident or injury and developing chronic pain, um, you know, quite you know, significant magnitude. So then, of course, we come to the brain and the role of the, you know, you know we look at the, the effects of uh, traumatic stress on the brain and we look at the brain processes that are involved in chronic pain and then how EMDR kind of fits with brain informed therapies so for example with chronic pain there is uh, there is an ascending and a descending pain pathway 
and the descending pain pathway is originates in the somatosensory cortex and the limbic system of the brain both areas which which will you'll learn are stimulated by EMDR so now I've learned a lot in my 30 years I still have a lot to learn but in this next in this in this workshop I'm going to share you, with you what I have learned and we're going to start with oh before I before I get to that I want to say that um, EMDR isn't a standalone thing that that you do with chronic pain and it's supplemented by adjunctive therapies and there's a lot of fancy footwork and flexibility required in the application of the protocol so you'll you'll learn this through the course but it is it is different it will open up your work because really to, to use EMDR effectively with chronic pain you have to pay a lot of attention to what's going on in the body and you have to be able to recognize and work with that in clients more intuitively than I think is probably the way EMDR has been taught. Uh, I think there's too much emphasis on the clients just responding to the bilateral stimulation and trusting their ability to do that. But we'll, we'll get into that later. So in, the first, so in the first segment, I want to talk about really the history of pain and not just because it's interesting, and it is, but because really ever since Descartes, we've been arguing and I think misunderstanding the relative contribution of physical versus psychological factors to chronic pain. And even now when we know so much more about the effects of stress on the brain, uh, we, we still, I think our clients and ourselves and many treating professionals, think of pain in terms of you know, is it physical or not physical? And the reality is it's much more complex than that. Neurological factors, psychological factors, genetic factors, personality, environmental. So understanding the history of pain will really give you a very quick overview of the issues and themes in, in the way as a culture and as a, as a profession we understand pain, the role of the brain in pain, why EMDR is indicated as a treatment for chronic pain, and then we'll be ready to leap into how to use EMDR in the treatment of chronic pain, some of the differences in the EMDR pain protocol, some of the differences in the adjunctive strategies that are needed to support you, a resource installation, the role of dissociation, uh, the different kind of blockages that can come up in the treatment of chronic pain and how to address them. And um, it's, it's a whole package. So let's get going. So in the history planning preparation phases of the MDR, we're trained to look for past memories or events that are you know, precipitating the client's presenting problems. It's really very rarely that there is one touchstone memory that you can link to the client's present pain, at least in my work, which is I'm working with quite a variety of chronic pain presentations, including post-traumatic pain, functional pain and nociceptive pain or pain that's associated with some sort of injury or illness plus of course whatever other life stresses and traumas that person has suffered so really what i'm looking for is um, of course that tra that trauma history but also just a general life history attachment uh, issues if they're there the medical history when did the pain start how did it start um, where they, where, really where the client is at now on their pain journey. And, and it's not just what happened, but who did it happen to? And this is a point I emphasize a lot. So who is this person? Who were they before they had pain? How do they normally manage uh, negative emotions? And, and you know, how does that inform how they're coping with their pain? Quite, quite typically, I see clients who... Um, actually look quite together and are, are, are maintaining themselves quite well but underneath the surface they're in a lot of stress there's a lot of agitation sleeping problems the nervous system is quite elevated they're, they're in the fight flight numbing uh, response and they need help to really to to self-soothe to dampen down those tension levels in their body as a first step to managing their pain so I'm not just gathering information. I'm I'm using my I'm also using my own sense of of the person, my own you know my own reactions to them as part of that assessment. 
um, and I'll show you'll see that in this next segment um, that, that it's not just taking information it's using your own body as part of the assessment process okay so let's get started so in this introductory segment I just want to orient you to working with chronic pain with EMDR. So this is going to be a kind of pain 101 if you're new to this area and perhaps a bit of revision if you've been working with pain for a while. And we'll see really how do we get from DACA to EMDR. I love history. We can learn so much about ourselves by understanding our past as any trauma therapist knows. And, and pain and the way we treat it and think about it is dripping with cultural and historical baggage. For example, 40 years after the IASP defined pain as, quote unquote, a sensory emotional problem associated with actual or potential physical damage, why do doctors still look askance at people who have pain that doesn't match you know, what's on the x-ray or the scan? And why do pain sufferers still desperately seek for a medical explanation for their pain? As you'll see in the section on the history of pain, these debates have been raging ever since Descartes made his famous observation that pain didn't come from the gods, it came from within the body. We'll also look at some modern psychological theories of pain. Theories aren't reality, but they provide a scientific basis for understanding the problem and developing treatment approaches that are relevant and more likely to be effective. We'll also be reviewing current knowledge about the role of the brain in pain. And this is exciting and helpful for a couple of reasons. One is that, of course, it helps us develop treatments that really are more focused on the brain activity that maintains pain and in a way that is more informed. And secondly, just from a purely uh, clinical point of view, it gives you a model and a, a way to explain how pain can occur in the absence of diagnosable physical pathology, which sure helps those poor clients with unexplained pain feel a little bit less crazy. And of course, one of the key implications of understanding the role of brain processes in chronic pain is the realization that chronic pain is actually a kind of memory. So we'll be looking at memory, the different kinds of memory, and the implications of that for treatment. And finally, we'll see how these discoveries regarding the role of the brain in pain and memory indicate that an information processing approach such as EMDR is indicated in the treatment of chronic pain. So why pain? Why, why should we be interested in pain as psychologists? Number one, it is the oldest psychological problem. Medically unexplained pain, or hysteria as it used to be known, it was the first problem that got psychology going. It's, it's, really, it's where we come from. Secondly, it's a major health problem in its own right. 60% of visits to primary physicians are for medically unexplained pain. Thirdly, it's a major life stressor in itself. So apart from any other trauma or stress or psychological problems, if a person has chronic pain, they're going to be traumatized. They may, have, they may develop post-traumatic like levels of anxiety simply as a result of being disabled in, and in pain, regardless of any other pre-existing trauma, depression, addiction. So it's a huge problem in itself. Last but not least, it's a doorway to unresolved trauma. So the child survivor of abuse or neglect who's developed certain coping strategies and ways of maintaining an appearance of normalcy loses all that when they develop chronic pain. And they're then faced with a crisis of confronting their trauma that they've been trying to avoid and successfully have been. So the person who comes in with chronic pain is in a very vulnerable, open position against their will really which needs to be recognized in treatment and used as a doorway to start in the client help to really work psychologically 
So I didn't attend med school, but I believe there's a saying that is commonly taught. It's in the history. So if you want to understand chronic pain, you've got to understand the history. So in this brief section, we're just going to do a very quick rundown of the history of pain from a theory, from pain as something that originates in the body to something that originates in the nerves to theories about hysteria and trauma and then back to the mind again and then the brain and then right up to the present day where you'll see that brain theories of pain that acknowledge the role of traumatic stress on the on the brain and brain activity are essential to understanding chronic pain and also developing effective treatments. From a psychological point of view, modern pain management could be said to have begun with Pierre Genet in the late 19th century. Genet believed that unexplained physical symptoms were a way of preserving and reproducing trauma or severe stress via dissociation. Genet defined association as a separation between the conscious and the subconscious, which only occurred when the central nervous system was overwhelmed. To quote, the memory traces of the trauma linger as fixed ideas that cannot be liquidated as long as they have not been translated into a personal narrative and instead continue to intrude as terrifying perceptions, obsessional preoccupations and somatic re-experiences. The capacity to adapt breaks down and the patient ends in a state of chronic helplessness expressed through both psychological and somatic symptoms. So Genet was not the first psychiatrist to talk about dissociative reactions. Bruquet and even Descartes talked about dissociation, but he was the first to systematically study dissociation and identify it as the crucial psychological process with which the organism reacts to overwhelming trauma and which results in the wide variety of symptoms then classified as hysteria. Before Genet, pain theories reflected evolving attempts to explain pain in terms of discernible physical pathology. Pain that did not fit what they then knew about disease processes was thrown into the diagnostic bin of hysteria or neurosis. I should say that not all chronic pain sufferers' symptoms are a result of dissociation or big T trauma, such as sexual abuse. Genet said it is the emotionality of the event that is the key to whether it becomes traumatic or not. And it's now recognized that most people experience altered states of self to some degree, especially those with hysterical narcissistic or borderline disorders. There are also other, perhaps more insidious forms of trauma than sexual abuse or combat or assault. For example, up to 80% of chronic pain sufferers have some sort of attachment deficit or disorder. And we know that affects self-care and emotional regulation. And that's a much higher percentage than in the quote unquote normal population, which is where it's around 50%. But trauma was involved in the production of unexplained pain long before attachment, which is a more recent theme in psychology. Although having said that, Balby's theory of attachment traces its origins as far back at least as the psychoanalytic era in concepts such as object relations theory. Freud also had a theory of attachment that an infant's attempt to stay near a familial person as a result of survival needs and food and attempts to satisfy libidinal desires. But our modern understanding of pain really began with Descartes, who first described pain in terms of a problem that arises as a result of nerve activity within the body. This understanding of pain as a product of physical injury is the basis for our understanding of acute pain or, or specificity theory. Before Descartes, pain was thought to emanate from outside the body, for example, as a result of a curse from the gods or malevolent spirits or fairies. After Descartes, there was a quest to understand pathological anatomy. Where does pain originate and how does it get transmitted in the body? And this is when the whole mind-body controversy, which still 
rages today got started. Because the challenge then became how to explain pain that did not fit current knowledge, whether then or now, about the nervous system. If you believe that pain comes from the gods, then of course this problem doesn't arise. But so, ever since, there's been a continu continuous debate about the relative contribution of nerves, organic injury, bodily organs and emotions in maintaining pain. And you'll see as we go on how theories of pain just swing backwards and forwards between how much weight they assign to biological versus psychological factors. So an early successor of Descartes was Robert Witt, who thought that every disorder was based on nerves. And by nerves, I don't mean emotions, but the actual physical neural pathways that transmit sensations through the body. Witt thought that nervous disorders were caused by too great a delicacy of the nervous system or irritable spine. For example, he believed that irritated nerves of the uterus produced the symptoms of hysteria in pregnant women. He did demonstrate that the spinal cord was the center of nerve communication in the body. William Cullen took an, a rather uh, more either-or approach and tried to distinguish between nervous conditions and conditions with a more organic origin. So Cullen viewed hysterical and hypochondriacal disorders in terms of nerves, and he was the first to coin the term neurosis. So while Witt would have been content to define neurosis in physiological terms, such as oversensitive nerves, Cullen looked at disease in broader terms, the role of actions and feelings in disease. He believed that if no biological explanation could be found, then any disease must be considered to be a product of a nervous disorder. But he did not view nervous disorders in purely physiological terms. Cullen considered that nervous ailments involved the mind and the body, including the disease and how it affected the organism's intellectual functioning. He was the first person to refer to an imbalance in a person's emotional stability or mind-body connection as a neurosis. And he was the first to use the terms hysteria and hypochondriasis. His recognition of the importance of a patient's mental state led to his introducing placebos, which could be active or inert substances, to address patients' psychological needs for comfort and hope. However, Cullen's ideas were replaced by a return to focusing on pathological anatomy as a basis for understanding disease in the 1820s. As a result of this return to focusing on the nervous system, reflex theory emerged. Reflex theory was developed by Marshall Hall, a Scottish gynecologist who saw the spine as a central control board of a vast network of reflex actions. Reflex theory was based on the idea that nervous connections running down the spine constituted a second nervous system that regulated all bodily organs in that any organ could influence any other. Reflex theory combined elements of previous theories, the idea of spinal irritation and reflexes. So for example, according to this theory, the cramps of pregnancy were a product of reflexes and spinal excitation. Hysteria, for example, a lump in the throat or paralysis, was thought to be caused by convulsions in the uterus. Reflex theory led to the use of surgery on the uterus in an attempt to cure the symptoms of hysteria. Now, as wrong-headed as that sound, in fact, treatment has always been based on current theories and ideas. That's how medicine proceeds. Reflex theory was also part of attempts to make medicine more scientific by distinguishing between conditions for which there was discernible biological pathology and conditions which were medically inexplicable. The aim was to develop a more precise description of conditions based on observable physiological phenomena, but it led to just about everything for which there was no discernible physiological basis being labelled as neurosis. Chacot, the famous French neurologist, based his theory of hysteria on reflex theory. Chacot believed that hysteria was inherited and, and that it had a physical basis, 
like Descartes and Witt. He performed autopsies on deceased patients in an attempt to find the physiological basis for medical conditions. He once hired an elderly man who had a bad tremor to work in the kitchen at the Saltpietre Hospital, excuse my pronunciation, with a view to performing an autopsy on the man when he died to find out what was causing his tremors. As you can imagine, the head of catering wasn't keen on the new hire, and indeed after many broken plates, the man finally expired, and Chacot was able to perform his autopsy. This led to the uncovering of the physiological basis of multiple sclerosis. Chacot also mapped the symptoms of Lou Gehrig's disease, and he hoped he could do the same with hysteria, but he never succeeded. Reflex theory eventually disappeared after Chacot's death due to four things. So the first thing that was one of the death knells for reflex theory was the discovery of the endocrine system in 1870. So the endocrine system is, of course, the collection of glands that produce hormones that regulate metabolism, growth and development, tissue function, sexual function, reproduction, sleep and mood, among other things. Hormones enable one part of the body to influence what happens in another part of the body, even though there's no connection, kind of like the body's Wi-Fi. So, for example, the pituitary gland regulates thyroid through TSH, or thyroid stimulating hormone, adrenaline, adrenals through cortisol. So the endocrine system provided a rather different model of how one part of the body or one organ could. Another thing was research methods. So basically a procedure was conducted on the uterus of 20 hysterical women to see how many of them got better. Only one got better. And it was found she'd visited a sanitarium while recovering from the procedure. And as you can see from the picture, 19th century sanitariums were not like modern psych units. They were lovely places to go where exercise and physical and mental well-being were emphasized. Three, pseudosurgery. So a physician by the name of James Israel found that patients got better after pseudosurgery, which rather disproved the notion that there was actually anything wrong with their uteruses or anything else. And finally, the rise of psychological explanations, especially the recognition that trauma could lead to physical symptoms as described by Genet and others. The recognition that trauma is qualitatively different from stress and results in lasting biological change goes back to the dawn of contemporary psychiatry. A century ago or so, Pierre Genet taught that overwhelming experiences are accompanied by quote unquote vehement emotions which interfere with proper information processing and appropriate action. He thought that this hyperarousal caused the characteristic memory disturbances that accompany traumatization by interfering with information processing on a verbal and symbolic level. Hyperarousal causes memories to be split off from consciousness and to be stored as visual memories or bodily sensations. Fragments of these visceral memories later return as physiological reactions emotional states, nightmares, flashbacks, or behavioral reenactments. Genet thought that the original excessive physiological response to trauma accounted for the continued emergency responses to subsequent stresses. He claimed that fear needs to be tamed for proper cognitive appraisal and for appropriate action. Experiences which overwhelm people's coping mechanisms set the stage or to use Pavlov's later concept, condition them to react automatically with excessive emotional reactions to current experiences rooted in the past. At the end of his life, Chacot came to understand unexplained pain too as dissociated affect, as suggested by Genet and embraced by Freud. So Freud also recognized that past trauma could lead to and be remembered as present. So Freud coined the term conversion and the psychoanalytic concept of anxiety associated with 
unconscious memories that are repressed and converted into physical symptoms. Freud believed that physical symptoms could serve as a signal of distress or a way to convey forbidden fears and passions when social standards and mores prevented direct communication. These suppressed rather than repressed emotions may sometimes be represented symbolically by the symptoms. For example, a person whose legs are paralyzed might feel as though they can't stand on their own two feet. Freud also felt that the fixation on the trauma is biologically based. Quote unquote, after severe shock, the dream life continually takes the patient back to the situation of his or her disaster from which he or she awakens with renewed terror. The patient has undergone a physical fixation to the trauma. He also recognized the role of hyperactivity. To quote, I think that one may venture the traumatic neurosis as the result of an extensive rupture in the barrier against stimuli. We seek to understand the effect of the shock by considering the breaking through of the barrier with which the psychic organ is provided. Finally, Freud also coined the term secondary gain to describe how sympathy and attention might prolong conversion symptoms. According to this theory, symptoms of conversion disorder and other somatoform disorders are perpetuated by the advantages of acting and being treated like an invalid sympathy, attention, the right to postpone responsibilities, and sometimes financial support. Sociologists refer to this as adopting the sick role. Unfortunately, interest in the effects of psychological trauma was short-lived and ceased being of central concern. As van der Kolk notes, from the beginning of the 20th century for the next 60 years, attention to the psychological effects of trauma was relegated to a few studies of the war neuroses and psychological sequelae of the Holocaust. After Chacot's death, French psychiatry gradually fell into step with the prevailing medical attitudes and the exploration of psychopathology continued along increasingly divergent paths, with little communication between the biological cognitive and psychodynamic points of view. The advances in the natural sciences fostered the study of organs and organic functions at the expense of such psychological phenomena as consciousness, emotions and motivation, for which the only tool of exploration was clinical observation. Genet pursued his studies in increased isolation. Interestingly, over a hundred years ago, Genet re disregarded or rejected the Descartian notion of mind and body outright. He thought it a tired debate. But by the middle of the 20th century, the limitations of the medical model could no longer be ignored. For example, its inability to explain phantom limb pain. And this stimulated the, the development of the gate control theory by Melzack and Wall in 1965. In a way that Cullen would have approved of, the gate control theory proposed that pain was maintained by both physical injury and mental factors such as attention, which mediated the experience of pain via a gate in the spinal cord. Melzack developed this theory after observing that animals that had undergone sensory deprivation reacted differently to painful stimuli than animals that had been reared normally. He was working with dogs and mice. Melzack attempted to describe the neurological underpinnings of the gait in terms of large and small fibres. Downward impulses from the brain on large fibres were said to close the gait, while upward impulses from the body through small fibres were believed to open the gait. So with the gait control, we've got ascending and descending pain pathways, and these can both re be retuned to work as analgesic pathways. So for example, touch receptors in the body send pain signals to the spine and the brain. There is a pain and temperature pathway that runs between the body and a nucleus at the base of the spine that acts as a kind of central connection called the substantia gelatinosa of Rolando. 
and that fancy sounding term just means it's a large gelatinous body that was discovered by an Italian with the surname Orlando. Anyway, this pathway relies on two types of fibres, A-delta for fast pain and C-fibres for slow pain. C-fibres also stimulate the release of a chemical called substance P, which can actually also inhibit the threshold for pain transmission. A-delta fibres stimulate the release of glutamate, which is an excitatory neurotransmitter. So remember, C-fibres for slow pain, substance P. A-fibres for past pain, glutamate. So if you touch yourself at the gate, action potentials get generated that give off collaterals which stimulate an inhibitory neuron which stimulates the release of GABA, which inhibits the transmission of action potentials from the pain fibres. That's why we rub ourselves when we've banged our knee. So gate control theory coincided with the development of behaviorism and then cognitive behavior therapy, or CBT. And this fitted well with gate control theory to explain how cognitive in inputs, for example, might moderate the experience of pain. Reflecting the enduring popularity of gate control theory, CBT continues to be the dominant psychological approach to the treatment of pain. Despite the modern acceptance of pain as a physical as well as a psychological problem, the Descartian notion of pain as you know, defined primarily as a product of physical pathology has persisted and, and continues to limit the way a lot of people experience and look at pain. And one possible explanation for the persistence of viewing this pain this way uh, goes back to history. So, for example, in 19th century rural Ireland, if you had an unexplained leg pain, they would say that you'd been blinked, meaning the fairies had fired a dart in your leg. If you were really unwell and not eating and not yourself, they'd say you were off with the fairies, which is where that saying comes from. And literally they interpret that as meaning that your spirit had been kidnapped by the fairies. In fact, that saying is a kind of early description of some of the sort of dissociative phenomena which can arise from trauma and illness, which we'll be talking about in a later segment. So unfortunately, in some cases, the remedy was to kill the afflicted person in order to reunite their body with their missing spirit. So one can see why uh, Descartes and his idea about pain would have been popular. The 1990s was designated the Decade of the Brain by H.W. Bush, which is ironic since he later developed a rare form of Parkinson's. Anyway, the 1990s was an era which marked the birth of the brain revolution. Key developments included the fMRI, the concept of neuroplasticity, the discovery of second generation antidepressants and the neural origins of alcoholism, which is also ironic since H.W. Bush's son, George, was an alcoholic, although he's since reformed. The next decade, 2000 to 2010, was declared the decade of pain research by Congress. This led to the acceptance of pain as the fifth vital sign and the recognition of the need to treat pain as a separate problem, which had the intended, unintended consequence of fostering the increased use of opioids in the treatment of pain and the current crisis. The 1990s also saw the emergence of more sophisticated theories of pain which recognised the role of the brain, such as neuromatrix theory. As the name suggests, the theory is based on the idea that pain is produced by distributed brain networks. Neuromatrix theory was inspired by Malzac's attempt to explain phantom limb pain, which does not have a physical location. So to quote Malzac, pain is produced by the output of a widely distributed neural network in the brain rather than directly by sensory input evoked by injury, inflammation or other pathology. So he's really getting to it here in separating um, pain from physical injury in terms of the way we understand pain. And he's involving the brain. 
So let's begin with a little tour of the main regions of the brain involved in the experience of chronic pain. First of all, we'll start with the anterior cingulate cortex, which is that black band uh, across the middle of the brain there. So the anterior cingulate cortex is involved in emotional processing, attention, and it's a cortical area most frequently linked to pain. It's also involved in the avoidance of noxious stimuli. The anterior cingulate cortex is also involved in the response to hypnotic suggestions to reduce the unpleasantness, although not the intensity, of pain. The amygdala, which is uh, down in the bottom left-hand corner there, is involved in effective and behavioral responses to pain and anxiety in chronic pain sufferers. The insula, back up to the right of that band in the middle, is involved in sense and self-awareness, bodily regulation, and affect and emotion. Some say the insula is where the body meets the mind. The somatosensory cortex is responsible for the perceptual recognition of the presence, location, intensity, submodality and quality of touch, innocuous thermal sensibility, and pain. And it bases its workings on the integration of input from different afferent sources. The prefrontal cortex transforms sensory stimulus into perception, but that's also involved in the downregulation of pain. Decreased glutamate in chronic pain sufferers in the prefrontal cortex, which is found to be a common feature in chronic pain sufferers, is associated with increased worry, fear and pessimism, and increased harm avoidance. One other area of the brain that's known to play a very important role in pain is the periodactyl gray. The periodactyl gray at the top of the spine links the forebrain and the brain stem, and it's involved in behavioral and emotional responses to pain. Although we hear a lot about the amygdala, Pangsep has described the periodactyl gray as one of the most important emotional areas of the brain. In chronic pain sufferers, the periodactyl gray appears to have increased functional connectivity, which decreases its ability to downregulate pain. However, electrical stimulation of the periodactyl gray results in analgesia, which fits in with the gate control theory regarding downward inhibition of pain. The periodactyl gray is one of the areas of the brain targeted by brain therapies such as transcranial magnetic stimulation, or TMS. The periodactyl gray also shows decreased activity following EMDR and bilateral stimulation. So a couple of things to point out here. One is, is to notice that the lightly shaded areas of the brain are those areas of the brain that are involved in the processing of nociception, which as you can see is a lot fewer areas of the brain than the darker ones, which are the areas of the brain that are involved in pain and emotion. Secondly, the areas of the brain that are mainly involved in the processing of acute pain is more the uh, limbic, basically the areas of the brain would associate with limbic and sensory processing. Whereas with chronic pain, uh, the prefrontal cortex is, is more active. So chronic pain involves more areas of the brain. So in 2000, Rome and Rome proposed a theory of pain which describes the role of sensation and emotion in pain in terms of the brain regions associated with these processes. Limbically augmented pain syndrome, or LAPS for short, describes how pain is processed via a two-tier set of brain structures in the lateral or back and medial or front regions of the brain. So the lateral system involving the thalamus and the somatosensory cortex is responsible for the sensory component of pain, or the yuck. The medial system involving the limbic and the prefrontal cortex is responsible for the affective or emotional component of pain, the yuck. So again, acute pain is mainly processed by the lateral system, those areas of the brain involved in processing sensation and emotion while chronic pain involves the addition of the prefrontal cortex.
the longer that a person experiences pain, let alone pre-existing trauma, the more activated these areas of the brain become, a process known as central sensitization. Pain Perception and the Human Brain Part of the survival value of pain is its association with learning centers in the brain. The brain circuitry associated with nociceptive and neuropathic pain involves areas considered to be essential in emotional learning, memory, and reward. The insula and anterior cingulate, together with the thalamus and basal ganglion, are most consistently activated in acute pain. The brainstem and the descending pain modulatory system also play a role, where activity is observed in both the anticipation and perception of pain. Clinical chronic pain causes increased activation of prefrontal cortical regions, which implies that chronic pain distorts the cognitive and emotional perception and processing of everyday experiences. Hypervigilance and an impaired ability to extinguish aversive associations of fearful or painful events seems to involve interaction among medial prefrontal cortex, basal ganglion, and amygdala which is consistent with clinical data indicating that chronic pain patients usually suffer from elevated anxiety, depression, and decreased quality of life. These observations demonstrate that the brain in healthy subjects is distinct from those with chronic pain, indicating that chronic pain is at least partly a neurodegenerative disease. That's just a nice little summary of the brain structures and processes that are involved in chronic pain. And um, it's introducing us to the idea of pain as a memory. They mentioned there the basal ganglia, which is a set of structures that connect the cerebral cortex, the thalamus and the brain stem. And the basal ganglia is involved in procedural memory. And you, you'll see why that's important in a minute. Cognition and emotion and eye movements. So at least 50 years ago, Milton Erickson, the famous American hypnotherapist, presaged the idea of pain as a memory, even though he didn't have the neurological knowledge that we have now. And he would, he would break pain down into its remembered and anticipated components as a way of helping chronic pain sufferers learn to manage their pain. He was also someone who I think it was Carl Whitaker said had the most amazing left hemisphere he'd ever seen. And we'll talk in a later segment about why that's relevant to our work with pain. So at the end of the video, they describe pain as a neurodegenerative disorder, and they're referring to the changes in brain structure and activity that occur in sufferers of chronic pain. And really it's those changes in brain activity that we trauma therapists understand lead to some of the health problems that uh, PTSD sufferers experience. And it's those, those permanently altered patterns of brain activity that represent or, or illustrate pain as a kind of memory. So pain is not simply a reflection of peripheral inputs or pathology, but also a dynamic reflection of central neuroplasticity. So this idea or recognition of the role of changed brain activity in maintaining pain also, also really makes it very difficult to keep thinking about pain as purely a reaction to physical injury or in terms of nociception. And chronic pain is a persistence of the memory of pain and or the inability to extinguish the memory of pain evoked by injury. So in the next session, we're going to talk a little bit about the, roles of, the role of stress in pain and how uh, post-traumatic stress and severe stress leads to brain changes which predispose people to pain following injury. So I'm sure you're familiar with this model of memory as a two track process where, where there is declarative memory, which is factual information and procedural memory, which is learned bodily responses and, and emotional conditioning. And that chronic pain and many traumatic memories are essentially a kind of procedural memory. 
So accepting the role of the brain in maintaining chronic pain helps us to understand some of the unique characteristics of chronic pain, which people who adhere to the uh, Cartesian conceptualization of pain find so difficult. So for example, amplification, the idea that pain can be greater than the injury that caused it. Spontaneity, that pain can occur even though the sufferer has not engaged in any physical activity. But if you understand that pain is coming from the brain, then it's got nothing to do with whether the person's been overdoing it or not. Although, of course, that too can aggravate pain. Neuroanatomic spreading, the idea that pain can spread to the other parts of the body is not related to the original injury. And last but not least, cross-sensitization, the idea that pain sensitization can spread to other stimuli. So the brain pain model incorporates many of the historical elements of pain theories, but of course they're better understood. For example, the modern equivalent of Witt's spinal excitability would be central sensitization. The modern equivalent of Hall's reflex theory would be anatomical spreading. So just before going any further, since we're talking about pain, I probably need to define um, the three main categories of pain. Uh, of course, you're all familiar with the acute versus chronic pain distinction, but there's also nociceptive pain, neuropathic pain, and functional pain. Those are the three main types of pain you'll encounter in isolation or together in many chronic pain sufferers. So of course, nociceptive pain is pain which is driven by tissue damage. Neuropathic pain is associated with changes to the somatosensory system and functional pain, of course, is pain that's mainly driven by psychological factors. The other point I'd like to make, which uh, um, is that basically I think that the terms chronic and acute pain are problematic, particularly the term a chronic pain, because chronic pain is subjectively and etiologically so different to acute pain that it's misleading to because the term pain and chronic pain really just emphasize one aspect of a multifaceted problem. It's a bit like comparing the Zika virus with co coronavirus. Uh, both are caused, uh, both are viral and both involve flu-like symptoms, but after that the similarity ends because coronavirus is a, a life-threatening infection, whereas the Zika virus is, uh, involves a fever, but it's not life-threatening. So here's just some examples of those different kinds of pain. So of course, nociceptive pain would be pain associated with things like mechanical low back pain, or post-operative pain, or arthritis, or burn pain. Neuropathic pain, uh, pains of hyperpathia, which means increased pain sensitivity to normally painful stimulus. Hyperalgesia, increased generally increased pain sensitivity and allodynia is increased sensitivity to non-painful stimulus. Chronic regional pain syndrome, fibromyalgia, and functional pain. So that's, that's, that's symptoms like tremors, convulsions, fatigue, gastrointestinal pain, irritable bowel syndrome, and headaches. So you can see the difference between the three categories. But again, they're not discrete and there's often a fair bit of overlap in, in any one person. And I also think functional pain can be separated into two subcategories. Pain that is an unprocessed um, emotional or somatic uh, element of a traumatic memory. So in that sense, a procedural memory. And pain that is a dissociative antidote to unbearable emotional pain. Now, the latter may not be associated with a traumatic event. It's just uh, an incapacity of that person to express their emotional needs or caused by uh, chronic severe stress and a buildup in the body of uh, arousal and tension. Um, there's, it's a fine line between both pains sometimes and, and trauma can be um, present in both. So when we get to the sections dealing with uh, post-traumatic pain and functional pain, I'll be able to elaborate that distinction a bit more for you. Another reason I don't think the term chronic pain fits is, is the way it's uh, interpreted in relation to acute pain. So 
chronic pain is generally viewed as quote unquote unnecessary since it lacks the warning value of acute pain. And this is used as a rationale for encouraging chronic pain sufferers to get active and sometimes just to get over it. Now, despite the logical appeal of viewing chronic versus acute pain this way, until recently, no one had ever bothered to research whether this was really how things worked. But in 2014, researchers from the University of Texas did just that by inducing central sensitization in squid and seeing what happened. They did this by cutting the ends of some squid's tentacles and they then anesthetized some of the injured squid and then compared how normal, healthy, uninjured squid and injured, no pain but anesthetized, and injured, not anesthetized, that's the chronic pain group, squid reacted when faced with predators. The researchers found that the squid in the chronic pain condition were better at avoiding predators than both the healthy and the injured non-pain squid. So one of the lead researchers, Robin Crook, concluded that the propensity to develop chronic pain is an evolutionary encoded feature of complex neural systems. She speculates that the hyper-aware state in the injured non-anesthetized squid, the chronic pain squid, must be serving to protect them from the increased risk of death associated with injury. So this is sounding very similar to the symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder or hypervigilance that survivors of childhood abuse and neglect develop as a way of, of protecting themselves from further injury or threat. So in the next few minutes, I just want to talk a little bit about how, how trauma and stress affect the brain in ways that predispose a person to chronic pain. This is a huge topic and I can only touch on it, but I want to give you enough information to give you a, a bit of a handle on it and enough information to be able to explain to your clients why they have pain, even though there might be not be that much physically wrong with them. So we know that acute stress causes, uh, you know, the fight flight response and the release of cortisol and hyperarousal and, and so on. But what happens when a person has been under chronic sustained stress? Their whole nervous system goes into a state of dysregulation and altered, there's altered biochemistry. So for example, there's decreased uh, GABA, which is a neurotransmitter that keeps everything else in balance. And associated with that, there's decreased norepinephrine, serotonin, dopamine, endorphins, cortisol, and BDNF, or brain-derived neurotrophic factor. And just to explain, so serotonin's involved with uh, sleep and, and lack of which, of course, leads to fatigue, which is a very, very common problem in chronic pain sufferers. Uh, decreased dopamine is associated with decreased pleasure and ability to enjoy life and, and depression and more negative thinking. So decreased and also decreased endorphins, which uh, reduces the capacity of the chronic pain sufferer's nervous system to combat pain, uh, decreased cortisol, which affects the immune system and ways that lead to increased inflammation, which I'll explain in a minute, and decreased brain-derived neurotrophic factor, which is kind of like, it's, it's a substance that helps the cells of the brain repair and regenerate. And in chronic stress sufferers, uh, their brain is in, a, it's in a dysregulated state as well. So their mood and their energy levels are going up and down and sometimes they feel okay and energized and other times they feel completely hopeless. So there's no, there's no stability. They're very, very labile emotionally. So just to give one example of, of the neurochemistry of stress and how it can lead to, to pain or increase susceptibility to pain. So in acute, in acute stress, our nervous system stimulates increased cortisol, which stimulates the immune system to reduce inflammation. But in chronic stress, those cortisol levels become de depleted and the immune system is not functioning normally. And so inflammation occurs and there's nothing to control it. So that's just one example of, of how the biochemistry in the brain is affected by stress in ways that lead to chronic pain. Another way in which stress affects the brain in ways which can maintain pain is through its effect on the default mode network. 
So the default mode network is a network of interacting brain regions which become active when we're not focused on the outside world, when we're in a state of wakeful rest. The DMN is responsible for daydreaming, rumination. It's like a worry circuit, but it's often not even conscious. It's just there as a kind of background chatter. It activates by default when a person is not involved in a task. So it's on when you're off and off when you're on. And the default mode network comprises a range of cortical and subcortical structures, including the medial prefrontal cortex, the dorsal medial prefrontal cortex, which is involved in social directed thoughts, such as determining or inferring the purposes of others actions. So people who have social anxiety, uh, the hippocampus, which is involved in the formation of new memories, as well as remembering the past and imagining the future. So it's safe to say that chronic pain is a stress related problem caused by changes in, in brain functioning associated with unprocessed traumatic memories or psychophysiological stress, procedural memory. And this either produces pain as part of that memory or it predisposes the individual to pain through kindling. So as Robert Skaya in his brilliant book, The Body Bears the Burden, summarizes it, a traumatic event whose completion is truncated by a lack of spontaneous resolution of a freeze immobility response is associated with a complex set of somatic pathologic events. Kindling is intrinsic to the self-perpetuation of this pathologic process, driven by internal cues derived from unresolved procedural memory or threat and enhanced by endorphinogenic mechanisms inherent to both the initial response to threat and subsequent freeze dissociation. So when we talk about pain as a memory, of course, we're talking about procedural memory and we can be referring to either a post-traumatic uh, memory where pain's part of that memory or just a buildup of physiological arousal uh, stress responses that predispose that person to pain. And of course, because of the nature of traumatic memories, that person, whether, whether their pain is trauma related or not, is making no connection between their pain and the, uh, the stress or the trauma that stimulated it. So chronic pain is a problem with many causes, injury, brain changes, dissociation, attachment problems, nerve damage, even genetic factors, just to name a few. So it's a syndrome, not a symptom. And that's the mistake a lot of people make who still think of it in terms of injury, a symptom. It doesn't make any sense if you think of it that way. So just to, just to illustrate my point about the variability between pain and injury and how other factors such as personality can affect it, I'm going to introduce you to two individuals. Let's say that they were both raised in an impoverished circumstance and that they both had to take adult responsibility from an early age and that perhaps they were only raised by one parent. And we'll give them the benefit of the doubt and say that that parent was a good, loving parent. They both had a base education, but they both had to really learn to rely on their wits from an early age. So this is Kathy. Kathy tripped and fell as she was entering a train in the London underground system, or tube as they're called. As a result of that, she um, developed chronic pain for several years. She had to have intensive physiotherapy treatment. She couldn't work. She had to take a lot of painkillers. She uh, ended up suing the uh, railway system. And, but basically her life you know, fell apart as a result of a fall that didn't cause any major injury. Whereas Hal, on the other hand, was raised in a very um, difficult conditions. They were so poor, he writes, that they had to truck the sunshine in. His father was a ne'er-do-well who left his, his mother when he was very young and he was raised by a stepfather. It was a very hard life. Hal works as a stuntman. He's had 56 broken bones, two broken backs. He's been shot once. In his worst single accident, he had a broken back, a punctured lung, six broken ribs, and he lost two teeth. Hal has no pain. So you can see, but you can see also in the photos by the, uh, by the, by the facial expression that these two individuals have a kind of different outlooks on life and different affect. So um, you 
just can't think of chronic pain in terms of injury. You've got to look at not just what happened, but who it happened to. And that's a theme I'll be coming back to again and again in this workshop. So in 2001, Albert Ray and Albert Zibik produced a chapter in a book. Uh, the book is Practical Pain Management, and the chapter is titled Cognitive Behaviour Therapies and Beyond, and there's a copy of it in your reading list, in which they summarised the then state of knowledge about the role of the brain and memory and pain and the limbic system and so on. And they, they proposed in that article that uh, psychological treatment for chronic pain it needs to access the ascending and descending pain pathways, that it needs to be basically uh, top down and bottom up, i.e. that it needs to be based on neurophysiological models and that it should stimulate thalamospinal nociceptive inhibitory fibres, that's the ascending system or bottom up, as well as desensitizing limbically augmented aspects of the pain experience. So the brain, the limbic system, or descending and top-down systems. There's been many other uh, authorities, brain experts, pain experts, who have uh, pointed out the need to consider you know, what we know about brain functioning in developing pain treatments. But these were, I think, the first. So just recapping the ascending and descending analgesic pathways. You remember earlier we talked about the ascending system, which relies on touch or heat to stimulate collaterals, which in turn stimulates inhibitory neurons and um, substance P and glutamate or levels get altered in ways which uh, mitigate the pain experience. The descending system, which we haven't talked about, uh, involves stimulation of two areas of the brain, either the sensory cortex or the limbic system, which in turn stimulates the periodactyl gray, which stimulates action potentials, which releases serotonin and norepinephrine, which in turn stimulates the release of endorphins and enkephalins, the body's natural painkillers. You'll note that each system relies on different biochemical processes. And of course, the ascending and descending systems rely on different kinds of inputs, although they're not unrelated. So for example, the ascending system relies on inputs such as touch, hot and cold stimulus, topical lotions, acupuncture, um, outside the body uh, inputs, whereas the descending system relies on more psychological and more mental inputs, including EMDR, uh, pendulation, which we'll be talking about later, imagery and hypnosis and emotional soothing strategies and, and things like that. So if we take the recommendations of Ray and Zibik and other brain pain experts seriously, we're in, we ought to be interested to know what interventions are appealing to what areas of the brain. So based on a summary that I've made, um, here's what I've found. That imagery and mindfulness appeal to the anterior cingulate cortex and the prefrontal cortex. And those are important brain areas in the experience of pain. But only psychotherapy, by which I mean CBT or psychodynamic psychotherapy, and EMDR appeal to all the areas of the brain involved in pain, including the amygdala, the insula, the hippocampus, the anterior cingulate cortex, and the prefrontal cortex. Now, for various reasons, which I'll go into uh, later in the workshop, I prefer EMDR because I believe it, it, it takes a more bottom-up approach to regulating the physiological arousal and overactivity that maintains pain. So for example, I think because of the way EMDR is able to dampen the procedural element of chronic pain, increased physiological arousal and such like, that facilitates um, a change in the way uh, pain is remembered and those patterns of brain activity that maintain pain. So to quote Rand Zibik again, by separating the affective dimension of linked memories with a resultant appropriate response, i.e. relaxation, EMDR appears to allow us to access the patient's abilities on a neurophysiological level and establishes a more normal emotional response to pain, which tends to be maintained. And from Gerhard et al. in a review of EMDR treatment of chronic pain in 2013, 
EMDR processing results in the transfer of information from implicit to explicit memory systems that no longer contain the disturbing affects and sensation. And finally, from another review in 2014 by Tassars et al., EMDR may have some impact on the underlying pain process in corticolimbic set levels, resulting in an altered perception of the nociceptive information, rather than being restricted to secondary pain management effects. And research which I conducted in 2014 seems to confirm EMDR's ability to produce these effects. So in this study, which I did with a couple of colleagues, we took 11 subjects and we had four therapists. Four of the subjects had been diagnosed with PTSD, but nine of them actually met the criteria in terms of just their levels of anxiety and PTSD symptomatology. They received an average of 10 60-minute sessions of EMDR. All reported decreased pain, anxiety, and depression. At the end of the treatment, eight of the, eight of the nine no longer met the diagnostic criteria for PTSD, and the gains were maintained at a, at a one-month follow-up. So here's a super quick history of EMDR treatment of pain up to a few years ago. So in 1993, we had the first uh, case report of EMDR treatment of pain in a traumatized fireman with burns pain. As of 2018, there were three controlled and 13 observational studies. And in the, in the Tassar's review, they found complete pain relief in 15 to 40% of subjects and five out of 12 of those studies with types of pain treated ranging from phantom limb pain to headache to chronic musculoskeletal pain, fibromyalgia and postoperative pain. And the authors noted that EMDR had the edge on traditional psychological pain treatments because of its ability to alter the sensory effective dimension of pain rather than just teaching sufferers to learn live with it, learn to live with it. So pain relief rather than pain management and gains tended to be maintained or improved upon at follow-up. So can we say EMDR is an evidence-based treatment for chronic pain? The National Health and Medical Research Council of Australia has the following guidelines for recommending treatments. They have to be evidence-based. They have to have consistent results. They have to show a potential clinical impact. The evidence has to be generalizable and they have to be applicable to our national healthcare system. According to their criteria and according to the research base of EMDR, the EMDR is an evidence-based treatment for chronic pain. And it's arguably, it has a good level of evidence. It's not a level one treatment yet, but it has a, it has a good level and it, it is improving all the time. So for the last 30 years or so, cognitive behavior therapy has been and continues to be the dominant psychological model for approaching the treatment of chronic pain. However, a 2013 Cochrane review by Eccleston et al. found that the central assumptions of CBT are unsubstantiated. They also noted the inability of CBT to change pain and that it only has modest effects on mood and disability. They summarized the overall treatment effects of CBT treatment of pain as weak and concluded that there'd been more than enough randomized control studies of this method and that new ideas are sorely needed. So in the next 10 segments, I'm going to be describing the EMDR PRAIN protocol. First of all, the assessment preparation phases and then the desensitization to closure phases and how to frame your approach to the treatment of chronic pain around a seven-stage trauma-oriented approach that is phased and client-centered. I'll also point out eight differences, at least, between the EMDR trauma protocol and the EMDR pain protocol. I'll then demonstrate EMDR and the treatment of different kinds of pain, including post-traumatic pain, functional pain, and medical pain and some of the different targeting and processing issues that are associated with each kind of pain. I'll then describe some unique approaches to developing resources for helping people cope with chronic pain 
and some adjunctive strategies for clients who have ongoing pain or whose pain actually doesn't respond to EMDR. We'll talk about dissociative phenomena and chronic pain, what, what they are, how to recognize them, and how to address them. We'll talk about dealing with blockages, which are when EMDR processing doesn't flow um, simply. We'll finally finish up with how to maximize bilateral stimulation. So EMDR is really a body-centered psychotherapy. And when you're working with bilateral stimulation, you're really working with the client's experience of a somatic stimulus and their ability to notice those changes and integrate them. And I'll be showing you some tips for how to do that with chronic pain sufferers. If you'd like to learn more about how to use EMDR as a treatment for chronic pain, I invite you to visit my website, www.overcomingpain.com, where you'll find articles, research, tips and handouts and worksheets and details of my online training program as well as details of the live trainings that I do from time to time across the globe. Thank you.